as, as the chair moves to the front there. On the next bill on the agenda is House File 4133. Represent Chair Anderson, would you like to move the bill to put it before the committee? Yes, Mr. Chair, I, I would certainly like to do, these mics aren't very strong here. I would like to do that, to put that bill before the committee, Mr. Chair. Representative um, Anderson moves House File 4133. Representative An Anderson, please present your bill. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chair and members. And uh, to do that correctly, I'm going to call on uh, the legislative person from the department, Ms. Place. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Ms. Place, please testify, share your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Thanks for the opportunity to do a walkthrough of our policy bill. Um, and thank you to Representative Anderson for carrying the bill this session. So um, I'll just kind of walk through um, the different sections of the bill. So section one, um, the intent of this section is to provide municipalities looking at developing community solar or wind projects an avenue to fund feasibility studies. A feasibility study is necessary to receive funding for a project and these studies cost around $25,000. We've heard from stakeholders that this language may need to be tweaked a little bit and we're willing to work on creating language that will accomplish this policy objective. Section two of the bill is a semicolon, the addition of a semicolon, um, to align the state's commercial feed law with the federal definition of drug under our feed chapter. Sections three through five establish a new meat processing license category for custom exempt food handlers. Um, the addition of a cu custom exempt food handler license would allow small operators who only process animals as custom exempt to be licensed using the correct regulations rather than trying to fit them into a category that does not accurately reflect their scope of operation. In this category um, of meat processing, the product is all labeled not for sale and is returned to the owner of the animal for personal use. This does not add or change a license fee. It simply creates another category using the same licensing fee structure to accommodate a different business model. For example, MDA staff frequently encounter situations where custom exempt operators believe that they can operate at a retail exempt operation because they have the retail license, but have not actually done the required plan review and don't meet the retail food requirements. <coughs> also, this helps um, new businesses that are only intending to conduct custom exempt operations at the outset, but intend to transition to retail later as they can be issued this type of license more easily and with fewer requirements. Moving on to section six of the bill, which is on page seven, starting at 7.17. This section changes the egg statutes statutes to expand the time that eggs can be held by retailers past the pack date. It allows grade A eggs to be held for 46 days past the pack date, which, is, which more appropriately reflects the length of time eggs can meet the grade A standards, rather than holding them to the same standard as grade AA eggs. This change creates consistency with other states' requirements. It is part of a broader effort by MDA to update requirements for egg manufacturing and sales and to write plain language statutes. Manufacturers would be able to operate under the standards that mimic federal standards, which reduces complexity in the regulatory system. Section seven through nine um, are additions to the dairy chapter revisions that we made last session. In section seven, the milk storage requirements are reinserted, which include a waiver for the 72 hour time limit for milk pickups. This is especially critical for some of Minnesota's dairy farmers that may not be able to afford more frequent <coughs> pickup times. Section eight of the bill updates requirements for labeling of milk products to include the option of using addresses of distributors. This statute is critical for milk traceability, but this change allows for flexibility for milk, milk plants on how they label their product. Section nine reinserts the labeling requirements for aged raw milk cheese to include the label requirement 
that states cheese made with unpasteurized milk is aged for more than 60 days. <coughs> Section 10 of the bill removes the word disease from the emergency powers of the department so that we are able to address emergencies that are broader in scope than disease. This is consistent with other agriculture statutes related to emergencies. Sections 11 through 9 deal with the advanced biofuel and renewable chemical production incentive. These changes are intended to better define what is eligible for a production incentive payment under this program, which was passed with the intent of encouraging commercial scale production of advanced <coughs> biofuels, renewable chemicals, and thermal energy production from biomass. Section 11 and 12 define the term biomass and renewable chemical. And you will see these terms carried throughout the next provisions. In implementing this program, our staff noticed the definition of renewable chemical was unclear and could unintentionally, unintentionally result in payment for chemicals containing only a small fraction produced from renewable biomass. So sections 13 through 15 carried the ter new terms biomass into the appropriate areas of statute. Section 13 also defines what type of forest management plan is required, which is specified in the Sustainable Forest Incentive Act. Section 16 on lines 11.19 through 11.21 clarifies that only the percentage attributable to renewable chemicals in a blended product is eligible to receive payment. Section 17 is more clarifying language, as well as including, including the forest management plan language from the Sustainable Forest Incentive Act. These changes are necessary this session because the department is expecting claims for payment to be made in the coming year, and we want to ensure that the, the payments do reflect the intent of the program. We know that there are a couple other bills moving on this topic and want to work with all the stakeholders involved to make sure that the language is workable. Continuing on, um, Section 20 um, would allow for the use of livestock expansion loans to include purchase of an <coughs> existing livestock farm. Currently, loans are only available to make improvements to an existing livestock operation. Section 22 through 21 um, are updates to the beginning farmer tax credit program that was passed last session. Upon implementation of certifying beginning farmers for the new tax credit, um, changes were identified by our staff administering the program. Section 21 removes the restriction that does not allow this tax credit to be used by family members or spouses. This was actually a policy choice made by the department that um, those who want to stay in um, rural areas and farm um, should be incentivized to do so. This section also removes the requirement of submitting a profit potential statement. Through implementation of the program, our staff found this as an unnecessary step in the process. We would also like to add waiver language to the education requirement. Um, this language is consistent with education requirements for the Rural <coughs> Finance Authority loan programs. Section 22 clarifies the appeal process for the beginning farmer tax credit and aligns it with the appeal process used at the department for the Rural Finance Authority loan programs. <laughs> Section 23 um, to the end of the bill are changes to the Rural Finance Authority programs. Um, Section 23 through 24 are changes to the disaster recovery loan program and would allow for the use of the program under um, market, disaster, market disaster or economic emergencies and wouldn't limit the use to the, of the program to a natural disaster or a state declared emergency. This would add some financial options for farmers when situations arise, for example, when creameries cancel milk contracts or if trade agreements impact product movement, et cetera. This could be an option to keep a family farming under one of these challenges. Section 25 um, would allow the methane digester loan program to fund more than one methane digester project. Um, this proposal came as a request from a constituent. Section 26 um, changes the loan limit amount from $40,000 to $100,000. 
for the livestock equipment loan program. This limit has not been changed since the beginning of the program and rising costs and inflation make the $40,000 limit low and unusable in many cases. And finally, in section 27, um, this proposal also changes the loan limit amount from $45,000 to $100,000 um, for the farm opportunity loan program. And this limit has also not been changed since the beginning of the program. With that, Mr. Chair, I'll take any questions. Representative Munson has a question. Go ahead there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, to the testifier, uh, I guess uh, this is a, a great program. Um, the, uh, one of the concerns I had, and I just want to clarify, are you, by removing the family members from this list, are you then allowing children of farmers to take out loans? Mr. Chair, um, Representative Munson, um, actually, this is for the beginning farmer tax credit program. So yes, we would be allowing family members and children of farmers to utilize that tax credit. Okay. A follow-up, Representative Munson? Um, well, I, I guess I have concerns about the, the number of uh, applicants that would come into the program for this. I just wanted to ask uh, maybe the Chair Anderson could, could follow up on that. Uh, Chair Anderson. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I share your concerns, but uh, in consultation with the author of the bill, Representative Nielsen, um, there's a pretty good sized pot of money available for the program. And in the first year so far, we haven't, haven't reached that, the, the total amount. So it was a thought that uh, let's get the full amount of money out there. And this was one way to, to make the program broader and uh, allow the full amount of the five million dollars to be utilized and um, so uh, again with in consultation with the author we thought that this was a good way to get the program up to speed at a faster pace and I think we could look at it again if, if it would fill up quickly we could look at uh, something else down the road but uh, as of right now we, we want to get the whole program out there um follow-up representative Munson no. It, it looks like you have a question. <laughs> I just yeah. is there is uh, is there some type of check to ensure that the that the children of the farmers actually actively participating and that it's their main source of income or yeah oh, that'd be my question, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Yes, um, the the job of the Department of Agriculture within this program is to certify that everything is accurate um, and then we send that over to revenue so that they can actually implement the tax credit so yes our staff definitely goes through like tax records and everything to make sure um, that it's a legitimate um, application okay. okay thank you thank you um, representative Lewick uh, thank you mr. chair uh, and uh, to uh, both the department and the, and the bill author, I just wanted to compliment uh, the, uh, particularly the element here on the biomass uh, programs. Uh, where I live, we don't do a lot of corn and beans, uh, but we, we do do rotational harvest of trees, and it's a huge big deal. Uh, we're uh, on the cusp of some real breakthroughs, I think, in, in the, uh, uh, chemistry of those various uh, tree species and what we can do with them uh, from a, a harvestable sustainable standpoint and so it's really important that we continue to make adjustments as this program moves along uh, it, it, uh, it is very important and I can say I encourage you to continue to open up discussions with the forestry folks which are used to only talking to the DNR <laughs> uh, but uh, I appreciate that work. It's uh, really important to our area because uh, we do grow trees and we do harvest them uh, just on a little bit longer rotation than corn and beans. But thank you. Okay, um, that was more of a comment there. So thank you, there, Representative. Um, Representative Bly. Uh, thanks, Chair. And um, actually, I, I had a question very similar to what Representative Munson was asking about. Uh, I've worked on this bill a little bit, and I, I heard from both sides on that issue of. Uh, the family members, and I, you know, I, I can definitely see there are some situations where it'd be good, and uh, some situations where it might be abused. And you know, you give some reassurance, but uh, uh, are there other checks and balances that could make sure that uh, it isn't being abused, and that you know, although we want to get the money out there, we don't want to have it spent down so fast that it doesn't reach a wide group of people who are 
who need it. So I, I just want a little more clarification. I, I understand that there's uh, good arguments for and, and uh, concerns too. A misplaced? Mr. Chair, Representative Bly, yes. I mean, if, if we want to add more clarification into the statute, we're very open to working with you on that. But, um, you know, even just in the applications that have come in, our staff have kind of made some catches um, with, with situations where it's like, well, maybe this isn't actually a full-time farmer, so. Thank you. Any other testifiers? I mean, any other questions from members first? I'll represent Sock. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, uh, this is being left gingerly gray relative to defining what a child is, whether they qualify, and where and how it's appropriate. And I'm, the more it gets talked about, the more uncomfortable I'm getting simply because of the, the grayness of the definition. So is there any way for you to help me out in understanding that these are people actually in the business and are happen to be just children or are we at, I mean there there's the inference of a fair amount of flexibility and laxity relative to de definition oh, is that a misplaced mr. chair representative so um, I don't have the entire um, statute before me but I, I can assure you that we're not just giving tax credits to families that have been farming together or where it's just a small part of their income or where they're just signing off a portion of their farm to their children for the tax benefit. We are going through all of the paperwork to make sure that it is a beginning farmer and a new entity um, that is utilizing this tax credit. Uh, follow up? Uh, no, thank you for that. It, that's much clearer, if you will, the, the words actually we're able to be tied together and, and end with a clarity. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. No. Uh, oh, Chair Anderson, go ahead. Thanks, Mr. Chair. And I would agree that there's, you know, there's been a lot of thought and concern about opening up this program. Uh, and I can understand, you know, it, it may look as if it uh, may not be more fair, but and not putting words in your mouth, but I would think if an application comes in from a, a father-son, for example, they would be looked at closely to make sure that uh, it's legitimate and um, that it would qualify for the program uh, as, as any other application would be, but it would be, it would be looked at closely. Uh, mi Ms. Place, was that... Uh do you have any other? Mr. Chair, I, I concur. Okay, good. I did, it looked like you had a comment, so there you go. Okay, um, Representative Munson. Yeah, thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just wanted to follow up. I think that um, so many of our farmers are transitioning farms to their children already. And I think that the, the program without family members in it is so great because it allows new people to come into the industry to, to, to get, you know, bridge that really big barrier of getting into farmer uh, getting into farming. And uh, I, I just, I would prefer to not have family members allowed in this program. And if there was, a, and I don't know how much this program is currently being marketed uh, to new farmers, but, um, but I would hope that we would really give preference to people coming into the industry who are not currently farming or children of farmers using these tax credits to buy, oper buy into operations that are not owned by the family so that the, the parents, the people who are farming and the family don't get the benefit, but we're actually allowing children of farmers and one maybe one one child is taking over the family farm and the other child wants to use this program to buy into another you know another operation um, then that's my opinion and I, I, I would I guess I do have a question what what uh, what's being done to advertise this program and to market it to people who are you know not children of farmers well Ms. Place Mr. Chair Representative Munson um, yes, the de department has a whole website, and we've we've been promoting it through a press release and social media. But I do know that some of the organizations involved have been um, really great at getting the word out there about application or applying for the program. Um, I I understand your concerns about um, getting people who are not already in the farming system into farming, and certainly we want to encourage that as well. 
out of the $5 million that um, was allocated for this program this year, um, only 550,000 of it has been encumbered so far. And so um, we, we wanna make sure that, first of all, farmers can thrive in this you know, pretty tough agricultural economy, um, even if they are related to you know, someone who's already in the farming business. And we have discussed with stakeholders, um, perhaps there could be like a set aside for people who aren't related or maybe underserved communities who don't always um, have the same opportunities with access to land. Um, and I'm willing to work with um, you and other members of the committee and our stakeholders to see if, if that's something that you'd be interested in. Thank you. Okay. Representative Pearson. Well, and and I, I've shared those concerns. I've probably been the most resistant to um, not amending this change that the department is asking for. Uh, but again, as, as Ms. Place has, has mentioned, the amount of funds that have been used, the 550,000 of the 5 million that we've allocated for this year, while we're only in the month of March, we know how the agrarian economy works. We're not, no one's gonna be leasing land in December. So a lot of those commitments are, are being made right now and, and just for the next couple of months. So we're, we're really just trying to open this up now, but I would encourage the members of, of this body, this, this committee, to keep an eye on this moving forward because it's, it's, a, it's a nation first program. Um, this this beginning, beginning farmers tax credit isn't used anywhere else in, in the country that we're aware of. So this is something that is new. And as we, as we look to the future, again, that may be something we wanna ratchet back um, in, in future legislations, but opening it up for, for the remainder of this year seemed like a, a good use of the funds and, and especially considering the rural economy at this time. Okay, thank you, Representative. We have um, Representative Mahoney. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, we all know that lawyers' kids become lawyers, pipefitters' kids become pipefitters, farmers. We've had 4-H and FFA or FHA, whatever it is, um, come through here and every one of these young people say, I wanna go into the agricultural business. Great, that's perfect. I spent all summer meeting with um, young farmers trying to get into the business. Um, uh, we should open this up. We should be very careful how we open it up. Um, most of the young people that I was talking to on New Farmers were you know, less than, well, they weren't being, they weren't being able to buy an awful lot of land at uh, anywhere from five to $10,000 an acre. So I don't know that $100,000 is, um, is a large dollar figure. Um, I think the idea of bringing more kids into farming um, and starting that whole new world of, of you know, us horrible, terrible, rotten people from the metro area going out to urban air, uh, greater Minnesota to actually start businesses is a good idea. Um, I would suggest, and it's not a question here, but this seems to have created a kind of kicking the hornet's nest, so to speak. It might be, uh, if I can give some advice to the chair, is to uh, uh, have the department come in and explain the program what it, they, what it takes to go through with the application, how they check, how they double check. I mean, I look at it from the economic development piece and how we have fostered the not helping a small business, uh, I don't wanna call it cheating, but skirting the uh, rules and regulations. And, and that would be a good thing because I think everyone at the table here has some concerns about it. So Mr. Chair, I would suggest that you find time on our schedule, even if it's after deadlines, I hope, um, for the department to come in and give us all some uh, comfort in this. Because I don't think $100,000 a tax credit, although it is a large amount of money for everyone in the state, it's not a large amount of money for people to get started in a farm. Representative Anderson, I mean, Chair Anderson, excuse me. Thanks, Mr. Chair. And Representative, I didn't know where you were going to go when you started talking, but I really <laughs> appreciate your, your common sense approach and your ability to look at a wider. And I, I think the limit on this program is 50000 if I'm not mistaken. So it's, relatively speaking, not a, not a large amount in terms of the overall amount it takes to get into agriculture. But yes, that's, that's an excellent idea. 
and we will do that and uh, get the folks in here to explain the program and maybe we can get an extra publicity push to get out there and as representative uh, Nelson was saying this is the time of the year when when these things are getting finalized loans are getting approved and uh, uh, the activity could be at, it, at its highest so we'll do that thanks for the the comment and uh, we will do it okay seeing no for oh go ahead representative thank you chair uh, I just had an idea would urban farmers uh, young farmers that purchase land in the urban area um, producing foods for local farmers markets um, that sort of thing would they be eligible for this loan um, who wants to answer that uh, you guys are both looking we'll have misplaced did you want to take the stab at that mr. chair I really don't know I can get back to you on that okay that that would be great thank you um did um house research have any opinion on that um mr chair the author of the provision last year um might have a comment too but i don't we're talking about the tax credit at yeah. the moment right um i don't see language in the the members have before them the language about eligibility on page 13 uh, section 41b.0391 i don't see language offhand there that specifies that the farm for which the credit is available is in a rural part of the state uh, but the but the author may want to comment as well yeah and I and I don't have it in front of me but I believe it has to have currently if it's being used for agricultural purposes then it can can be transferred using the tax credit or rented using the tax credit I I believe but okay thank you representative Pearson any other questions from members Mr. Chair, I would I would also just add that you know that's a, that's a gr good point, very good point, and I see no reason why it shouldn't apply to anybody in in urban agriculture. So we'll we'll check on that and and uh, thank make you. Sure that it is or could be. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, do we? Ha does anyone else wish to testify for or against House File Forty One Thirty Three? Okay. Mr. Peterson, <coughs> you have the floor. Go ahead. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, uh, members, I, I'll be very brief. Uh, my name is Tom Peterson. I represent the Minnesota Farmers Union. And we appreciate the opportunity to offer uh, uh, support for two provisions in the bill. The one you've discussed quite a bit, uh, the beginning farmer uh, changes. Uh, this is something we have worked on and supported for 10 years. And really want to thank you for passing this the last year and we have done a major push uh, trying to get this out to our members had a lot of interest in it a lot of people it didn't work for this year but we are seeing you know a lot of interest Ms. Place gave you the numbers on it our policy does support adding it to family members um, you know but we have had discussions in our organization about maybe putting a percentage or something uh, in it might be something you might want to look at uh, going down the road whether it's 10 percent or 50 percent or whatever so that because the first priority was on those people who don't have a leg up from their family to get uh, into farming. But we need, with the average age of a farmer uh, being 58 years old and the new ag census, it's probably gonna go up to 60 years old. Less than 10% of our farmers in Minnesota are under the age of 35. Uh, there's a lot of reasons to do that. Um, there, uh, uh, there, there are definitions too in the bill that uh, as for family members as to what uh, you have to be actively farming you have to have a schedule F there's a lot of things that we feel would provide uh, security as Ms. Place said and also talking with her uh, and the Department of Ag we do feel better about uh, that as well the other piece we wa uh, wanted to do uh, just uh, I think is very important in this bill is in section 24 which would expand the use of the Rural Finance Authority Discover, uh, Disaster Recovery Loan Program uh, by giving the Commissioner of Agriculture more authority to determine an agriculture emergency or a market disaster. As, uh, as Ms. Place also mentioned, uh, the, a lot of things we've seen come up and, and uh, the state is not able to uh, uh, act fast enough. And so like dairy right now, there's a lot of different dairy situations going on. And we do think that uh, this could be helpful in those situations. And these, the disaster loan recovery program uh, works for things that aren't typically covered by uh, insurance. 
And so I really appreciate consideration and advocacy of that. And um, I think that's a very important program. So thank you for your consideration. Okay, any questions for Mr. Um, Peterson? Okay, seeing none, thank you for testifying. And then we have um, uh, Ms. Am um, Amber Gleaser um, with Farm Bureau. It's your floor. Thank you. Good morning, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Amber Hansen Glazer. I'm the Director of Public Policy for Minnesota Farm Bureau. I just wanted to briefly um, share Minnesota Farm Bureau's support for expanding the beginning farmer tax credit. I think there's been a lot of good discussions about some of the possible concerns, and we look forward to helping address some of those. But I think in the current economic climate, any opportunity we have to help support beginning farmers, regardless of their path into farming, is going to be important. I think um, Representative Pearson brought up a good point that this is um, a first in the nation program, and we've had a lot of questions and, um, and interest from other state farm bureaus in what Minnesota has been doing. So I think it's fantastic that we're leading the way into making sure the next generation of agriculture is um, able to continue farming. Open to any questions, thank you. Members, any, any questions? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Any other, anyone else wishing to testify for or against House File 4133? Okay, uh, final words, um, Chair Anderson. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I'm glad we got no questions dealing with this uh, class AA eggs. I thought that was gonna be a hot topic here. <laughs> but, uh, no, with that, Mr. Chair, I would encourage your support for the bill. Thank you. Okay, thank you, members. House file 4133 is laid over.